Welcome to the Industrial Talk Podcast with Scott McKenzie. Scott is a passionate industry professional dedicated to transferring cutting-edge, industry-focused innovations and trends while highlighting the men and women who keep the world moving. So put on your hard hat, grab your work boots, and let's go. All right, it's time to get cracking with the number one industrial-related podcast in the universe, the Industrial Talk Podcast. My name is Scott McKenzie, and I am absolutely honored that you have joined because here on this particular podcast, this platform, we celebrate the women and men of industry, of manufacturing, because you're bold, you're brave, you dare greatly, and boy, do you innovate. It is an absolute honor to be here. Okay, another, and I mean another incredible interview. Bill Shamarza, Chief Innovation Officer with a great company called Hitachi Ventara. Let's get going. Yeah. So last week was a little interesting because I was in Northeast Ohio visiting Team Neo. Neo that's uh, Team NEO Northeast Ohio. And all the incredible manufacturers in that particular area. It was just an honor. Uh, they're passionate about what they're doing. They're just, it's it's off the charts and talk about the innovation talk about the the spirit of collaboration it's happening in northeast ohio and uh but the best part about it is that they're just wonderful people they they truly want to make my life better and your life better by manufacturing the goods and um that are needed for this particular market they're not stopping they need to do it all right so, you know, you've heard me uh, hammer on, and one of the things that I did come back from uh, Ohio is that it is the power of collaboration. Now, we have challenges out there. That's absolutely correct. And the bright side, if you can look at it from that perspective, the bright side of COVID is that it's really brought many, the ones that truly want to be successful and want to create uh, or be able to not just survive but rebuild and prosper in this next normal. Thank you, Jay Foran from Team Nemo, Neo for uh, that particular word, next normal. And uh, they collaborate. And you know as well as I do, we've, we've got to be about collaboration. We've got to be about innovation. We've got to be about education. And we've got to do it with a sense of urgency and speed. And we can't, we can't just sit there and say, oh, my gosh, I'm going to make a mistake. You're going to make mistakes because we've never been through this. Be bold. Be brave. Dare greatly. Let's make those mistakes. But in this particular conversation that I had with many, they attributed to those three components. We're, we have a spirit of collaboration, so go out there outside of your company. You, you've got to succeed. From my heart to you, you've got to succeed. So you have to collaborate. You have to innovate. You're going to have to, not just from a technology perspective, but from an overall, you know, how do I deal with my resources and how do I deal with my people? How do I deal with my business? How do I create a sense of resiliency? And more importantly, uh, a theme that came out over and over again is education. So it's right in line with exactly what uh, the Industrial Talk podcast has been just sort of talking about as a result of conversations with leaders such as this gent coming up, Bill Shamarzo. How about that for a segue? Bill Shamarzo. So he's a data scientist. He's much smarter than me, big time. And, uh, but talk about a passion for what he does and a passion on how to help people succeed in this next normal. He is, uh, the, the interview was... <laughs> Got to tell you, I, I was extremely excited. He is an author, and he has got some mad skills. Go out to his, indust, uh, his uh, LinkedIn profile, mad skills. You'll be sitting there going, wow, he's pretty good. But the best part about it is he's, he's, just, a, he's just a guy who wants to help people succeed. And, we, and instead of really talking about data, which it's all peppered in there because data is a very important component to your success and your resiliency going forward. We talked about collaboration and the power of collaboration and uh, the necessity to collaborate. And you need to really take note of that because collaboration is going to get us through this. 
um, that that willingness to talk to other people, look for solutions, uh, gain insights. And I'm telling you right now, it hasn't been, I mean, it's been a fantastic time for people who are saying, I'm here to help. I'm here to work with you. So collaboration is on the interview today. All right, let's get to it. Bill Shamarzo, that's S-C-H-M-A-R-Z-O. Hitachi Ventar is the company, and he is. He is the chief innovation officer with that company, and boy, does he innovate. So enjoy the conversation. All right, Bill, welcome to the Industrial Talk Podcast. Absolute, and I mean absolute honor that you have joined and are beginning and going to share your insights and knowledge with the listeners of the Industrial Talk Podcast. How are you doing, my friend? Scott? I am doing great, especially considering it's a Tuesday. <laughs> you, it's a COVID week. I have no idea. I just sit in the salt <laughs> mine each and every day and just, you know, chirp on this particular mic. I have a grand old time. All right, for the listeners out there, let's uh, level set because I've looked at your stat card out there, right? I have. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's quite impressive. So let's uh, give us a little 411 on who you are. So I am the Chief Innovation Officer at Hitachi Vantara, and you can think of Hitachi Vantara as the digital arm of Hitachi. But the thing that really turns my crank, the thing that gets me up in the morning and excites me, is, the, is my teaching. I, I teach at the University of San Francisco where I'm an executive fellow, and I am an honorary professor at the National University of Ireland in Galway. I do lots of lectures for universities and such. I, I get pulled into a lot of them, and I, I gotta tell you, Scott, that is what I live for. I'm at the age now in my, my career where, um, you know, job's great. I've got a great job. It's a great company. It's very people friendly, very customer centric. I love it. But for me, it's about the conversations with the students, the people who are trying to learn. And by the way, you don't need to be 20 years old to be a student. You can be 60 and 70 years old and be a student, but you, but you got to have a mindset that says, I'm eager to learn which also means I'm willing to unlearn. See, I, I just really love that because I sit there and I, I look at the, for me, I love learning. And I love the fact that I can continue to learn. And until I'm, you know, six feet underground, I can continue to learn. Right. And it's all out there. I mean, you can really find information that you need. Now, one, I'm going to go down this road. And I want to get your opinion on some stuff. So I've had the fortunate opportunity to interview tons of leaders, tons of industrial, manufacturing, whatever, tons. You be one. Now, the general themes have been, uh, I need to survive. This is COVID specific. I need to survive. I need strategies to rebuild. And I need to develop a sense of resiliency within my business to prosper. And if they're not in that mindset and they're not going down that road, then we've got some challenges. They revolve around retaining talent, managing risk. How do I save money? Because I just can't continue to go through this cash burn. How do I make money in this new world and how do I create resiliency? To do that, and I, I segue into this, I always talk about collaboration collaboration, not just internally, because you're going to have that uh, conversation with uh, people internal to your organization. You just have to. But not only that, because then everybody starts sort of drinking from the same well. You don't get the level of the next level innovation that can truly transform your business. And then to do that, you need to educate. And you need to do it with a sense of urgency and speed. And you need to make sure that you can make mistakes and feel like and you get back up. Can you talk to us a little bit about the power behind the collaboration component. So, so Scott, collaboration is a very interesting term because I would say most people abuse that term. They, what they mean, when most people say they say collaboration, is they, they, what they're saying is that I'm a senior executive and I bring in other people who are lesser than me and we collaborate by <laughs> me telling them what they should know. Right? Collaboration ends up being a one-way channel where I collaborate and you listen. True collaboration, though, embraces ambiguity. Now let me tell you something. Ambiguity is the key to human and society evolution. If we before, were all, Before I, uh, I'm going to interrupt. Define ambiguity. The ability to hold and deal with differing perspectives. Got it. To embrace differing perspectives. I mean, think about the human race has evolved, not because 
my children are a clone of me, God forbid, right? No, they are, they are a combination of the genes, a random combination of the genes from myself and my wife that hopefully builds a superior human being, right? In, in all kinds of ways. And so ambiguity, our ability to embrace different perspectives, intermix, blend, and break apart those perspectives is the only way we survive as a society, as a race, and as an organization. And so when you get to this word collaboration, I roll my eyes a lot because I always say, well, we've got to do more collaboration. I'm like, no, do you really know what collaboration is? Do you do collaboration around ambiguity? Do you embrace and seek out diversity of perspectives? Or are you bringing in people who are just like you, talking to people who are just like you so you can share the concepts that you already have, right? It's the difference between proving out something you already believe which is not what data science is about. Data science is about learning what the drivers of success are and embracing those. It's a, the difference in collaboration to me is, is an active learning process, not just from the person who's talking, but from all parties involved. And in order to learn, in order to learn, you must be willing to unlearn, you must be willing to walk into a conversation with your own biases and perspectives and hear different ideas and things from other people and go, Oh my gosh, I didn't get that. I, I got, Scott, so you got me going here. I got to tell you something. No, no, no. This is great stuff because I'm, I'm hanging on every bit. I'm writing that down like, like a man, man. I'm going, oh my gosh, I got another gem. Go so for I got, it. I got to tell you this story. So um, part of the benefit of, doing, of being an um, a, a executive fellow at USF is we did a research paper on determining the value of data. Now, the value of data conversation has always been something that's bothered me for 40 some years I've been in this industry. And the conversation has always revolved around how do I put data on my balance sheet? How do I reflect the value of data on my balance sheet so that my, my shareholder value of my company reflects the value of the data I have? And so I have been perplexed by that problem. How do I get data on a balance sheet? So what I did, I brought together a bunch of research students, right? And the beauty of research students, there's two beauties. One is they're very smart, or three. One, they're very smart. Two, they don't know what they don't know. And three, they're free. Right. So those are all very, very valuable commodities. Absolutely. And so they go off and start doing this research on the value data. They're researching all these different projects and studies and books and they're doing all this stuff. And then one of the researchers, she comes back to me. She says, Professor Schmarzo, she said, this data as an asset, as you know, an accounting kind of asset, doesn't, doesn't, there's nothing we like it. I don't know how to classify. She says, data never wears out. Data never depletes, and the same data set can be used across an unlimited number of use cases at zero marginal cost. When yeah. she said that, all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, I have been thinking about this all wrong. It's not an accounting mentality, where accounting is a valuation based on what someone's willing to pay for an asset. So these, these glasses here are worth you know, $10 because somebody, I paid $10 for them, right? No. It's an economics conversation where value is determined by value in use and how you use an asset to generate value. The, the whole idea of putting on, a, putting on a balance sheet had limited my view of what I was thinking yeah. about. And the minute she said zero marginal cost, I realized economic multiplier effect, I have the wrong vision. Everything I've been doing and thinking the last 30 years is wrong. Now get out of my office now. <laughs> you just ruined my day. No, it, it's one of those epiphany moments that yeah. came true. So now I'm an evangelist on this. In fact, I'm, I'm writing my fourth book right now. It's called The Economics of Data Analytics and Digital Transformation. It's all this economics things that, that I've learned primarily through my research at universities, but now have been validating with different customers we work with. And it's, it's about this unique aspect of data and analytics. So I don't, we don't need to talk about the ec economics of data and analytics. No, we, we can. We can. Yeah. <laughs> but it was really, it was my willingness to have a conversation yes. with somebody who had a different perspective, who wasn't afraid to say, you know, wasn't afraid to be Tom Hanks in the movie Big and raise her hand and say, I don't get it. I don't get it. She said, I don't get it. It doesn't look like it. And in that moment, literally changed my career. I realized that my mission had changed, that I had, been, I had been running down the wrong path, that I had running down a path that was going to top out, like everybody else had topped out on this path, until I realized, wait a second, I got to go back. It's a different path I need to go on. So 
if you're willing to collaborate around ambiguity, willing to unlearn so you can learn, that's when organizations make this transformation into resilience, where everybody yeah. brings idea, where everybody's idea is worthy of consideration, even though all ideas may not be worth a damn. See, and this is interesting. We, we, we understand the challenges that have come with the COVID world. We understand, right? Okay, got it, understand. But there are positives that have happened as a result of that. Like, like I looked at the pre-COVID world. We were pretty lazy. We were in a rut. We didn't need a challenge. We were just going through the motions. Yes. Somebody flips a switch, and then all of a sudden going, oh, oh, oh my God. Uh, now what do I do? Now how do I think? And it's freed me up and it freed others. And when we start talking about collaboration, I'm telling you, I'm telling you right now, as sure as I'm bald and ugly, that we do not have all the answers. And it is a bright future when we can collaborate in such a way that we would be willing to hear other people's opinions and then do it and then take action. And it's exciting for me. Sorry. I got to tell you a, a marvelous story. And it evolves around a concept called the economic value curve. And that is an economic value curve is a measure, um, a measure of the relationship between a series of independent variables and its impact on a dependent variable or business outcome. Story. So back in the 1970s, when I was growing up, you had a choice with cars. Either they could be high horsepower or good mileage, but never both. <laughs> right, I had a 68 Plymouth Fury 3, 318 cubic inch. It was bored out. Oh, it looked like a bat out of hell. I could race baby. it down back a road. You wish you have that. You wish you still had that. Uh, oh, the, the back end was so rusted out on that thing. I think there was pieces of the car flying off as I drive it <laughs> down the road, right? But it got like four miles a gallon. And when I raced it down Tobacco Road, it got like two miles a gallon. I mean, I was, <laughs> I was throwing ga gas out the window as I was driving, right? And then in the 1970s, we had the Arab, the Arab oil embargo. Yep. And the U.S. twice for the next 10 to 15 years mandated a change in mileage per car. So you had this, this economic value curve that said you could have either horsepower or mileage. And you can actually see the value curve of the choices you have over time. And then there's this period of disruption where because of this, this government mandate on mileage, companies had a change and it was a point of turmoil people were trying different things companies went under brands went under they they embraced the you know the uh, the winkle was it the winkle engine and they all kind of they tried all kinds of things it was a company, dark year or dark, dark dark decade man it was the dark year cars were awful <laughs> oh there were some awful cars in the early 90s and late late 80s Ooh, stay with oh, gremlin the gremlin. gremlin yes the pacer yeah, the pacer don't 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 run into that car by accident. Even if you're parking it, it'll blow up, right? It's just just awful cars. Yeah. And then what happened at some point in time? I don't have the chart in front of me, but it must have been in the early 2000s or something. Is that something magical happened? Is that we got better gas mileage and more powerful cars? We had hybrids and we had all kinds of you know uh, high compression engines and we had all you know we we did all this marvelous technology. And the economic value curve went from this downward trend, this period of turmoil, and then it went like this. And now you've got cars like the Tesla that has, you know, miles per gallon, infinite, right? Yeah. Yeah. Horsepower, out the roof, yeah. right? There was, in this period of turmoil, new ideas are going to happen. If we are to survive this COVID as a race, as a human race, we need to embrace the fact that it's not a choice between economy or healthcare. It's economy and healthcare, yeah. and figure out how you blend yeah. these things together to create something better and newer. So I, Scott, I think you're oh. spot on. We're going to come out of this. Some people are going to come out way ahead. There's going to be pockets of people who yep. won't let go of their old beliefs, who are locked in how they think, and they're not going to change. The world's going to go right by them, right by them. And, and you know, I've had that con conversation with so many other, I mean, you, you can see it. You can see people's willingness. Some are just saying, I need more information. I want to hear more. I want to consume more. It is a time of real uh, learning, specifically yes. when it comes to industry, manufacturing, and some of the things that I've got to do because I've got to keep the lights on. So I've got to be willing to hear and, and consume 
new ideas and and then really lean on not just companies like Hitachi, but other companies that, that'll also listen and say, I hear what you're saying. I think we can help and we could do it this way. And, and, and unless you're in it, unless you're saying, I'm willing to collaborate, I'm willing to reach out and not be that prideful SOB that I've been in the past and hear some new ideas and insights, you know, the, the, the resiliency part is going to go out the window because you're not well, going to, you're not going to start. It's got, I, I believe that, you know, my, my bias and I have biases, holy cow, shit, I got tons of biases, but yeah. my, my bias is towards data and analytics. And I think there's a lot of information in the data and analytics that can tell us stuff. For example, I know that my team and I could build a COVID-19 score that measures everybody's probability of catching it. We do credit scores today. The same concept would work. I, I know my team could build a COVID score that would measure your likelihood of getting sick or dying if you catch it, right? We can, data and analytics can tell us a lot. And when we take this current culture of uncertainty, we blend it with this desire for be resilience and we use data and analytics, we can build very hyper-personalized welfare and, well, and wellness programs for everybody in the country. And we're not all the same. If I catch COVID, I have a much different probability of dying than, than you or my, my kids, right? We can figure that out. It's in the data. And we can use that data to help us make very thoughtful, very laser-like informed policy and operational decisions. That's, that's kind of what we do at Atachi Vantar. We do it on, you know, it, it's on a, you think about all the organizations we're helping out. We're working with American Heart Association. We're working with you know, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of organizations. We're trying to help them. Rainforest Connection. We're working with them to help predict where their, the loggers are likely to cut down. The, we're not flagging when, when the logs have been cut down. We're predicting when they're going to get cut down and who's going to cut them down because it's in the data. Yeah. See, this is interesting because it's, it's – let's say I put my business hat on. I've been hit by the COVID two-finger death punch. I'm trying to just survive, and I've got a fire, five alarm fire here, five alarm fire here, my operations, my leadership, my this and that. I'm all over the place, right? In the world of data analytics, in the world of this business, me, and I, I see it, I've heard you, I'm going, wow, that's fantastic stuff. Where do you recommend to me to just start? Because, I mean, it could just, and it's not a slam, but... There are a lot of companies out there that are saying the same thing. We can collect your data. We can do this. We can slid it to the cloud. This is a data lake. Here's the edge. This is this. And, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. I, I just need a solution. And I need something that is I can understand and move forward because I want to know and understand, but I don't want to feel stupid in trying to. That's it's a great question, Scott. So here's here's what I'd recommend, I, I, and I recommend this because I have I have seen this work. There, are, I'm sure there's many approaches that that work. This is the approach that we take. We look at it as as how do data and analytics and technologies enable a culture of learning, a culture of innovation. Yeah, so nice. you can buy technologies from anybody. Um, but there, there's no value in technology. It's how you use technology with the value. It's the, that's that economics concept again. God dang it, economics. Here comes again, right? It's a value in use. And so you have to understand first and foremost, what's the mission of the organization? What are we trying to accomplish? What are our most important business initiatives? What are the use cases around that? Who are the different stakeholders we need to bring together? And what are the perspectives they have on this? And how do we embrace those perspectives to not come up with the least worst option but actually transform and synergize to come up with the best, best option, leveraging data and analyze all this technology. So it has to start with this cultural conversation of what does your organization seek to become? If you only want to buy technology, go buy technology. And, and maybe your organization's already had that, that epiphany journey. But most organizations I've worked with don't. In fact, I think <laughs> the one question I ask Every organization I, I get engaged with, the very first question that tells me whether I've got somebody I can work with or somebody I should just walk by, because I do reject customers. I don't have, I don't have time. I'm too old. I have no time for green bananas, right? I love so, it. So I ask a simple question. How effective is your organization at leveraging data and analytics to power your business models? That's it. That's all I want to know. How effective are you? 
Now, thoughtful organizations will look at you like they have like you have lobsters crawling out of your ears. They'll go, yeah. hey, we have no idea. Yeah. Right? Okay, good. What does good look like? Can we have a conversation about what does good look like? And by the way, we have something called the Big Data Business Model Maturity Index that I developed over many years that we walk people through. We can tell somebody how good they are and how good they could become. And if they can buy off on that journey, if they want to leverage data and analytics to really power their business models, they want to use that to disrupt their, their, the value change in the industry, if they want to disintermediate customer relationships, we've got a plan for doing that. But it's as much cultural as it is technology. And if you're not willing to make the cultural changes of bringing in all the people, bringing in all their different perspectives, yeah. then no amount of technology is going to rescue you. It's interesting because I've had that conversation. It always gets down to people. It just does. Uh, the technology is the technology, you know, zeros and ones, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's the tech. It's always the people. And, the, and when they start to come into the conference room to have that meaningful conversation, they bring in the bag of their biasness and then they sort of lay it out on the table and I'm not going down there. And, and, and yet, yet in the spirit of collaboration, the spirit of ambiguity, I mean, you could really make incredible advances if you're just willing to just say, I, don't, I, 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 I want our company to be this. This is what I seek to become. And right now, we're not there, and we don't even have any insights into our data. If we want to. <laughs> if you don't bring everybody along on the journey, yes. your organization – so here's the interesting thing about AI. AI is this hot topic, right? AI is going to take ML, a job, machine blah, blah, blah. Learning, blah. Yeah. So here's the interesting aspect. AI will have, first off, the biggest impact – not in the executive role, not on the boring mahogany row of know-it-alls, but AI will have the biggest impact at the points of customer and operational interaction. That's where it has the most impact. And it's not in replacing those humans, it's in how do I empower those humans to think more creatively? How do I empower the front lines with AI? Right? AI is only gonna do, AI can only do what's in the data. It doesn't have the ability to innovate beyond what's in the data. That's We're exactly human. Right. Yeah. So, so imagine I have, <clears throat> I have this, this advisor on my shoulder who's, who's talking to me saying, oh, I've seen that problem before. It looks like this, right? A little, little Yoda-like creature on my shoulder. Is saying, <laughs> you know, you, this is, and you say, yeah, but it's different. I, I think your recommendation is interesting, but I'm going to try this. And the Yoda's like, oh, okay, well, what are we going to learn, right? So you have this companion with you who leverages data and analytics to help you be more effective, but it doesn't replace human ingenuity. There's always going to be humans smarter than the models. I don't care how model good exactly. your model is. Exactly. And, and the concern that people have with AI, right? Uh, it's going to replace. No, it just creates greater opportunity for you to focus on greater things and, and less about that mundane thing right over here, that, you know, this spinning wheel over here. You don't have to go over there and, you know, do what you need. You get to focus on cool stuff. If as a human, your only value add is to follow the directions that are laid out in a book about how to do something, then your value add is zero. You're, as a human, your value add is to take what you've got and to innovate beyond that, to look at that and to think about the second and third derivative impacts of what's happening and say, okay, this is the problem. If I do this, it'll solve that, but it, really, it causes other problems. You need to be thoughtful as a human to think. And so that this whole idea of ambiguity is what makes humans so unique. Machines can't, AI model can't hold ambiguity. That's what we do as humans. That's why we evolve. That's why we're no longer being chased around by saber-toothed tigers. Well, at least not all of us. But right. <laughs> so it, it's how we evolve because ambiguity forces us to grow as a race and forces us to grow as a society. And it's going to force organizations to either grow and thrive or they will vanish. They, they will. They'll perish. And for me... And, and I'm fortunate I've had a number of conversations. What I've always been fascinated is that, once again, the speed at which humans today, people, can advance an idea. And so it's, it starts ever so humble, whatever that idea. But then because of our abilities, we can advance it so fast. And for me, Joe Sixpack, right, I'm still looking at version one thinking, Okay, I've got all this other stuff behind me, and I'm just looking at it. looks valuable, but you're already on version 10. There's this speed that always, as a human, I can't consume it fast enough. 
Yeah. So can, can I go back to a point you said about it's always about humans in the yes. process? It really yes. is. <laughs> so more projects die not because of inadequate technology as much as most projects die because of passive aggressive behaviors. Passive. That is, that is that you haven't gone through the process of letting everybody's voice be heard. Now, people will react negatively and they'll try to sabotage you. And, um, you know, like Jason and the Argonauts, they'll be evil creatures that pop up along the journey. Um, so how do you prevent passive aggressive behavior? You bring everybody into the process. You make sure everybody has a voice. And by the way, I want to hear everybody's voice, even the voice of somebody who doesn't believe. Because yeah. now I can, have a, I can have a conversation, a learning conversation, understand what's your rationale for why I won't believe. There's probably some good nuggets in there that I can tease out. So again, it all starts with, I, I, the leaders of tomorrow, unlike our leaders today, yeah. are those people who are going to be willing to reach across the aisle to people who have different opinions realize that we are not clones of each other and bring together the best of all these different perspectives to create something better than we've got. See, and it's interesting because when I was listening to you talk a little bit about passive aggressive, now I've been in conferences and here's the big thinker. The big thinker's at the end right over here, right? Yeah, and the course. big thinker really just sort of has that steely eyed glaze on his eyes or her eyes and they're looking around and they're not going to be they're, they're not, they're not going to sit there and be candid because, because the old way of leadership, you're going to slap that person pretty hard next time. And, and we've trained them to not say things. You are really going to have to transform that leadership as well to just say, Hey, huh? and, and I mean it, nothing's wrong here. Say what's on your mind because we're achieving something much greater. Well, it's, it's like the, the character Tom Hanks in the movie big. Yeah. Right? He raises his hand. They're talking about playing with a, a building that turns into a prehistoric monster. And <laughs> right. Tom Hanks goes, I don't get it. Like, who, yeah. who wants to play with a building? Right? And the, the head of the company, to his credit, says, you know, everybody's kind of like, oh, it's all the numbers show this is the wisdom of a kid. It's like, wait a second. No. Tell us more. Tell me more. Seeks out more information seeks out the controversial view. Now, the view on the whole may not be acceptable, but there are probably nuggets inside of that that you can pull out and say, that's a good point. I can reuse that. And if I take that nugget and I compile it with this nugget here and I blend them together, I get something better. So tomorrow's leadership has to know how to bring out the best in everybody. But at some point, you are the leader. And you have to make the tiebreaker decisions. You have to decide A or B. You have to make a decision. You just want to make that decision in a very thoughtful and informed way. With as much insights as possible. Yes, data, but also very important perspectives here as well. See, uh, I mean, it, it, COVID, baby. Pandemic world, it's time to be a different leader. You're going to have to at least begin to consume different insights. and different. It's... Um, it's been an interesting observation because I've seen companies contract, right, and start to really sort of build a wall and moat around their business and, 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 and not to begin, start to look at other options. And then I've seen other companies that are like, well, what do I got to lose, man? I'm already, man, struggling. Let's, let's, let's look at options here and then begin incrementally. It doesn't have to be the whole elephant. It could be just sort of consuming it incrementally and deploying insights and solutions in your organization and reaping some benefits to boot and you're changing and you're learning and you're growing in the, in the movie it's a wonderful life with jimmy stewart there's a Absolutely. scene where where the the market's crashing and everybody's storming the the savings and loan the bailey savings and loan to pull their money out and, and jimmy stewart as george bailey has this great line about the harry henry potter i think Potter was his last name. And yeah, for, yeah. And well, old said, man Potter or something old to man that. Potter, <laughs> yeah. said, oh, Potter's not selling. He's buying. But the, the smart companies, when there's a turn like this, they know it's going to come to an end. They don't know if it'll be two years or three years or 18. Yes. They don't know when it's going to end, but they know it's going to end. They all eventually end. And this is an opportunity for these companies to yes. amass to take advantage, to disintermediate competitors' customer relationship, to rejigger and re 
invent value chain process. This is an opportunity to grow, if maybe not grow revenue wise, but grow in capabilities so that when the market comes back around, you are at the tip of the arrow. It's, it's hard to grow when everybody else is growing. It's easier to grow when everybody's running back and hiding. Brilliant. So this, this is a time when true leadership says, we've got a window here of maybe two years. This thing is going to be down on the ramp. So this is where I need to move. And you better understand your, your, your customers you're going after. You better understand their journey. You better knock down the artificially defined uh, borders of your industry and say, I'm not constrained, constrained by this industry. I want to look at my customer journey from end to end and figure out what parts of those journeys do I want to try to drive monetization opportunities. I'm, I'm fatigued, Bill. I mean, I am just absolutely, I feel like you, you're my brother from another month. Keep on <laughs> mentoring me, baby. That's all I'm asking for. That is fantastic. You're abs- we didn't even start talking about the necessity to educate, the necessity and why. And we've just been just sort of talking. And, it, you know, it is, once again, people, listeners out there, think about it. Just think about it. Open up your eyes. Begin to collaborate. Begin to listen to other viewpoints. Reach out. And we got to wrap it up, Bill. I'm t- I mean, I want to do this again. But we reach out to Bill. His stack card's pretty ma- magnificent out there on LinkedIn. I'm telling you, collaboration is key here. And the willingness to be able to deal with ambiguity. Do it. God, I'm a new man because of you, Bill. <laughs> well, you- I can- Mission accomplished for today. But only for Big today. time, man. I am worn out. I am just on fire, baby. You can't see it, but I'm on fire. I've got the heroes of manufacturing right here. i got my shirt on. I'm ready to conquer the world. Hey, are you active out on LinkedIn? I, uh, LinkedIn and Twitter as well. Actually, I'm, I'm probably more, more active on Twitter. Now, I have to warn people on Twitter. You know, Twitter is full of evil creatures. If you, if you, <laughs> if you, if you hang on, you know, hashtag data science, Hashtag design thinking, hashtag AI. Um, there's a marvelous bunch of people who are sharing great ideas. I, I stand on the shoulder. We all stand on the shoulders of each other. Yeah. And so it's true in LinkedIn as well. You'll find lengthier conversations on LinkedIn. People can go, you know, you're not limited by what, 248 characters or whatever that number is, right? So you get more depth in LinkedIn. But I'm also very active in Twitter. And there's a lot of really bright people. You know, don't. Don't get distracted into some divisive political conversation that's happening on Twitter because they're everywhere. Be disciplined. Don't go down those paths. Stay in the swim lanes where you can learn from others. And I will tell you, there are some tremendous people who who I follow and and we we treat each other's stuff and we comment post on places like LinkedIn and Twitter. And I I, I don't go to Facebook. Yeah, no, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, listeners, we're going to be wrapping it up on the other side. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, thank you for joining the Industrial Talk Podcast. Absolute honor, absolute joy. Thank you. All right, listeners, stay tuned. We'll be back right back. You're listening to the Industrial Talk Podcast Network. Hey, thank you very much for joining the Industrial Talk Podcast. That gent, that powerhouse, that rock star, Bill Shamarzo. Reach out to him. Go to his LinkedIn stat card. That's S-C-H-M-A-R-Z-O. Hitachi Ventar is the company. Chief Innovation Officer is the, the title. And I'm telling you right now, and I mean it, you will not be disappointed. Reach out to him. He is very active out there on LinkedIn. A must connect for your network on LinkedIn big time. All right, we're going to wrap this up and we got to be about, and I'm just telling you right now, you got to be about collaboration as Bill indicated to succeed in this next normal collaborate and have that spirit of collaboration. You'll also need to innovate. You need to innovate. You need to look at all parts of your business to, and, and just put it under the microscope of innovation And then, more importantly to all of that, you need to educate. You need to just continue to educate because it is vitally important. Because you need to survive. You need to be prepared to rebuild. And you need to 
be successful and prosper in this next normal. That's what Hitachi is all about. That's what this platform's all about. That's what everybody on this wonderful industrial platform is all about. Be bold, be brave, dare greatly. Change the world. Thank you for joining.